Welcome to the Investment Cuddle, episode 10. I'm Gary and I'm here with Philip. And today on the podcast, we're going to talk about how you invest in unit trusts. For those of you that are not familiar with those, we covered those in episode three, I think. Yep. Uh, along with lots of other investment vehicles. So if you're interested in knowing a bit more about the details around unit trusts, check that out. So today, Philip, we're going to look at how we invest in unit trusts. We've obviously looked at trackers more recently. But when you look at unit trusts, they come in all different sizes, big and small. Does size matter? Well, of course, as with everything else in life, of course it does. But it somewhat depends on what you're investing in, depending on what the upper or lower size limit is before it has a material effect on your investment performance. So if I just take an example and give you an idea, just looking at the London stock market. So on the London stock market, um, I'm looking at data from the London Stock Exchange, looking at May 2020's data. There was a total of 1,130 individual companies listed on the market, main market, which had a total market capitalization. And just to remind everyone, market capitalization is the current share price times by all the available shares. And the current market capitalization of the London Stock Exchange was £3.1 trillion. Pounds. Now, if you look into that a little bit more and you look at the biggest companies on the market, so those that are, say, over £1 billion in market capitalisation size, there are 17 of them. So, so oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Some big, some big numbers and some small numbers there. So you said three trillion, trillion pounds, pounds sterling of market capitalisation. Yes, of the whole of the London Stock Exchange. And 17 of them are what percentage? So... These 17, which make up 1.5% of the number of companies listed, their market capitalisation is just short of £1.4 trillion. Pounds. So that's effectively just under 50% of the market capitalisation in the entire market. It is highly skewed to the big guys. Yeah, and that's interesting because I think I've heard people talk about the American market, and we might be talking about an index here, but you've got five, let's say, American companies that make up you know, the vast majority of that particular index. But what you're saying here is the UK market actually isn't any better? Not really. And it's just to put it in perspective. When I say the FTSE all share market, that is the market capitalised weighted version of the London stock market. So therefore, those 17 companies make up just under 50% of the FTSE all share index. So that's everything in the FTSE. That's, that's not the FTSE 100 we've no. talked about before. That's FTSE 100. Everything. That's everybody all added together in a big bucket. Yep. One big happy family. 45, 50, you know, nearly 50% of the... Yes. It's just the just 17 companies. Now, if wow. you were to do the, uh, the FTSE 100, it doesn't make a great deal of difference because it's all market cap weighted. So those 17 companies dominate that as well. And the FTSE 350, which is the sum of the 100 and the 250. So you see there's not a huge amount of difference. Because it's weighted by your size of your company, they just skew, skew all the numbers to them because they're so big. So let's give you a couple of numbers to put in perspective. If you take the companies which are less than half a billion in size, so 500 million or smaller, they make up 65% of the number of companies, so that's 735. When you look at their total market capitalization, it's only just under... £89 billion. Pounds. Now, when you look at that compared to the total market cap of the London Stock Exchange, 2.9%. So they can double, treble, and the market won't notice. No. And that's significant, isn't it? So therefore, you know, we, we, we took trackers on, I think, episode eight. And so again, you're buying, if you buy into the market, you're buying... Most of the 17. Mostly the 17. <laughs> and then... And Every other share is then one of the others. Yeah. And, the, and the little guys do better, and it doesn't make any difference to you. So. And again, if I pull up the other part of the London market, which is the alternative investment market, AIM, as it's often referred to, that is predominantly for small fledgling companies. That currently, again, taking June 2020 data here, there are a total of 830 companies listed, and it has a total market capitalisation of approximately 97.5% billion pounds sterling okay so a wee bit smaller a bit smaller but yeah. that but the aim is what does the aim stand for 
alternative investment markets. So these are small, predominantly small companies, not always, that wanted to list to gain money, um, which is slightly cheaper than doing it on the main market, and there's slightly less regulatory requirements on reporting as compared to the main market. So these guys invested there. Uh, generally, it was thought of you. Most people generally start an aim, get big enough, and then move to the main market. Not all of them, because there are a couple of very large companies still left on the aim market. They've just never left. Right. So the example being companies that have a market capitalization of over a billion pounds on the arm market, of which there are 18 of them, they make up just under 35 percent. So it's not quite as skewed, but it's still skewed. But it gives you an idea. So if you want to invest in small companies. If your fund is a colossal, say 20 billion, you are the market because you're going to move it. Right. So you can't be, if you're too big, you move the market. You can only invest in the big boys. You can't invest in these small boys. Right. Because you're just, you just buy, you can't, you just can't buy enough of them. So that's where, depending on what you're investing in, makes a big difference. So if you want to work in small companies, you probably have a natural limit in size going, if I go bigger than this, I'll just have to become a tracker by default. Okay, so that so that then brings us on to the point then about if you're going to buy some of these companies through a unit trust, you might think that, well, I I might think that buying into a unit trust that's big, the the amount of money that's that's been invested into it, gives you confidence that lots of people think it's good. Is that a better route than buying into a unit trust that's small and maybe therefore either not so many people have found it yet? Or it's not got a track record or whatever. What's the, what's the thinking there? Well, there's two ways to look at it. It somewhat depends on whether they're investing like small UK small companies or global global companies. So it depends what market they're actually looking at. Some of them, what you can find is they trade, when they become famous, they attract colossal amounts of retail money. So in the UK market, most people, if you ever read up in the local newspapers, national newspapers about finance and saving for your own money, you would have probably heard the name Terry Smith and Fun Smith. He is one of the uh, star fund managers at the moment. Others you might have heard of, such as Lindsay Train. So in the last, since since about yeah, in the last ten to fifteen years, these guys have been done exceptionally well, and they gathered a good reputation. So to give you an example, they so Lindsay Train have two main funds: a global global equity fund which invests anywhere in the world, predominantly developed countries. And then you have, and they also have a UK one, which just invests in UK companies. So if we take Lindsay Train, they have three main funds. They have global equity, a UK equity, and a Japanese equity. I'm going to talk about the global equity and the UK equity. Their UK equity fund is 6.25 billion pounds in size. That's quite large. When you look at the size of the UK market, three trillion, you're in that area going, I'm not too big. But I might need to consider that I may, if I get too much bigger, I might dominate the market too much because a lot of those small companies I can't buy enough of to make a difference to my fund because they're just too small. Because if you buy more than 30%, you must take them over. You must offer, by law, an offer to buy the whole company out. And they don't want to do that. So therefore, they're limited to the big boys only because the little guys, although they might have better opportunities, they're too small. If you look at their global fund, their global equity fund is invested in about 31% America, 34% UK, 20% Japan, 10% Europe. 7.8 billion pounds size. Okay, so comparable to the, the UK equity. Yes, in size. But when you look at what they're buying, then you're probably looking at, well, the European market is about 5 trillion for the total European market. The Japanese market is more like 4 trillion. can't remember what the American market is, but it's a lot bigger. Yeah, it's big. So now, if we talk about probably the most talked about fund manager in the UK at the moment, Terry Smith with his Fund Smith Fund. This is big. The current size of his global equity fund is 18.3 billion pounds. Now, when you look at that, it is, although it's a global equity fund, it's predominantly based in the US. So if you look at the current breakdown, 62% in American stocks, 16% with UK shares, and then the smattering of the rest around Europe. Okay, so predominantly a US fund, but that's compared to Lindsay Train, and Lindsay Train's a relatively famous. They're equally famous. Fund. Often, what's been said in the past about, so we say, very large fund management groups, they they often become once they get a star manager, they become asset gatherers, not asset managers, because as you can probably guess, if you're charging one percent 
on a billion pounds, it's quite a lot of money. If you got 10 billion pounds, it's 10 times the amount of money. But did it really take you 10 times more effort to manage it? Because mm -hmm. often what you'll find with funds are there's a fixed amount of money it takes for regulatory, for accounting, and for trading to run the fund. And then it doesn't really cost extra when you're 500 million to a billion to 20 billion. Probably is fairly similar. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. It scales a bit, but not not as much not as much as you may think. So there does come a point where if you've got a very very small fund, it will probably cost you more. But because it's small, it might be able to invest in smaller things that the big boys can't touch because they're too big. That even if they did double advise, it's still a rounding error for Terry Smith and his fund. So there can be ones where sometimes fees alone aren't the most important thing in your fund to consider, and also the fact that he's most famous. Because technically, he's big at the moment because he's done very well for the last 10 years. So I guess what we're saying is the sort of stuff that he might well have been buying in 2010, 2011, etc. When you Google Fundsmith and it was going to be further down the page than it is today, he can't buy today. Or if he does, it's not going to shift his performance That's right. because of the size of the fund. Yes, like Lindsay Train, they tend to hold a, a relatively small number of stakes. Now, I think for him, Fundsmith holds 30 shares, Lindsay Train, something around 40-something, I think, is what they do. So, therefore, if one of those is a really small company, he runs the risk of having... And if he buys more than 30%, he's got to buy the entire company out. So, he's limited to under 30%. Probably quite a lot of companies too small to even consider. Yeah. Okay. So, you mentioned their fees. Yes. Because of the size of these funds, are these guys cheap? Are well, they, you know, are they tracker cheap? Or are they slightly more expensive? Well, than it depends because unfortunately with trackers you can get a wide variety of tracking fees yeah. <laughs> from a, from over a percent to point point one percent or lower. So you can get big fees for differences. Yeah. Historically, Fundsmith was at the cheaper end of the market because it was below a percent. Now, generally in the recent last couple of years, there's been a lot more pressure on fees to push them down. So when you look at Fundsmith at the moment. We're taking the numbers from Hargreaves Lansdowne today, so they do change a bit depending on which broker you buy from, because some brokers are offered special deals, mm -hmm. whereas others aren't. Fundsmith is one of the funds, I believe, that doesn't offer a special deal to anyone. It's this fee for everyone. Yeah. And they charge, just for the annual management fees, 0.95% a year. Lindsay Train, on the other hand, their global fund, or their UK equity fund, charges the same fee structure, but they do offer different fees due to different brokers they sell it to so it's either with from Hargreaves it's 0.5% for others it can be 0.65% so quite a markable difference yeah We're talking 40% I mean, lower yeah the comments on fees that I've heard Terry Smith talk about before has been that that fee includes all of his trading fees all of his trading costs albeit he says he doesn't trade that often so th is that the same or are we just getting into muddy water with it's that it's very muddy water because I have seen Lindsay Train and Terry Smith tend to not trade very much at all. And I believe Lindsay Train trades a bit more than Terry Smith, but on average, compared to the rest of the market, they're very low down. Mm -hmm. So from numbers I'd seen some research elsewhere, the total costs, including fees for Lindsay Train, were a bit higher. But they were still, I believe, slightly lower than Fundsmith. But it's very murky. It's very difficult to actually get real numbers out of the fund management companies. Terry Smith has been one of the few that I've understood who's been more open about what it really costs. But it's very difficult to get light for light numbers out of it to be able to compare them all. Yeah. So, so I guess what we can say is take those percentage fees with a pinch of salt. You can look yes. up on any trading platform app or online to see what that particular platform is charging you for that product. Yes. But we're we're using Hargreaves. We're using Lanzau Hargreaves just just for the, the the fact of comparison. Now, so that's where you look at global equity funds. Now, if you look at other sectors. So if you like we talked about UK small company funds, there's probably a natural limit to them. But when you look at some of the funds, they can also be quite large. Example, picking a few names that you might have heard who are generally quite large in the UK company fund space, such as Aberdeen Standard Small Company Fund, that's 1.68 billion in size. That's not small. Mm -hmm. Then you've got another one, say Legal and General Small Company Fund, that's 238 million. So quite a bit smaller. Artemis UK Small Company Fund, 350 million. BlackRock UK Small Company Fund, 437 million. JP Morgan Small Company Fund, 
163 million. They tend to be mostly blur, blur billion because you get too big, you become the market, you have to buy the big boys in the small market and they don't always give you the best returns. Others, you might want to consider the size, are emerging markets because as you can imagine, the UK market is fairly large. Emerging markets, although there's a lot of companies, a lot of countries, they're not that big in value unless you're dealing with China. When you're looking at some of these emerging market funds, some of the more famous ones, such as Fidelity's emerging market fund, is £2.2 .2 billion. 91, which is the new name now for Vestec Investment Managers, so their emerging market fund, £1.5 billion. JP Morgan's emerging market fund, £2.1 billion. There are others when you look around in the emerging market space, they tend to be somewhere between 100 to 600 million. Because again, if you end up having to be very highly dominated in China, which is big enough to absorb large amounts of money, or you've got to keep your fund relatively small to make meaningful differences. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the ones where you definitely need to worry about. Size can become too much of a problem. Other ones are what's called special situation funds. These are some of the ones where your buying companies are out of favour. So this is often another way of calling them value stocks. Now, these ones here, again, you're tending to look at companies that had fallen down in value. Some of the ones in the UK space, Artemis, UK special situation fund, eight billion pounds. Oh, hang on, that one's big. Yeah, so that means for these guys, and they're just UK, you're limited to the big boys. So it's basically looking at BP or Shell falling, being out of favour. Because you can't pick up any out of favour mid mid table stocks because it's too big. Not that size because that's bigger if I yeah. remember than the Lindsay 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 Trains Train, Global. Yeah. So okay. you might find here that one's going to struggle long term mm -hmm. because it's got too big. Jupiter UK Special Situations two point two billion. Lions Trust Special Situations, which is predominantly UK, five point five billion. So there are lots of these where you're going. You've just got too big. Now, yeah. the industry has several ways of playing this. They can do what's called a hard close, which is basically once they get to a certain size, they stop taking any more money in. A soft close, which is once they get to a certain size, they stop advertising. Then they only take set money in from current investors or special, special brokers with special relationships to control the growth rate. And they can hold that on some of the better managed uh, should we say boutique fund managers tend to do this better because they are known to be better asset managers and not just asset gatherers so they tend to use that philosophy more to hold that so they don't get too big so they can keep getting the returns some of the big boys particularly those that after merging with other fund management groups just want to it's just all about gathering assets so that once you've got a star fund manager they balloon in size and then your performance just falls off and so you do have to be wary about who it is Sometimes you don't want to necessarily go with all these the people you've heard on. Sometimes, if it's like in small companies or emerging markets, actually the specialists who only look at that area, who generally are smaller, might be worth doing more research on and picking those because that's their speciality. Another thing that the uh, fund managers can do is they start a new fund. It has the same manager as the big one, but they start a new one, a version of it, and so it's smaller. So it can make all of the investments in the smaller companies that make a difference to get the better traction. So often you can find that the seven, particularly this is more of a case with the bigger investment companies, they've got several funds that look the same, that seem to be having very similar mandates, but one is a lot newer and a lot smaller and has the same manager. So that's one right. way they can get round it. Okay, so that you've got to just delve into, because I think it's sometimes it's quite confusing when you can... I don't know, one of the Aberdeen funds you mentioned there, you know, you, you search for them and there's 14, what well, feels like 1,400 and there's not 1,400, but it feels like that, of different versions of what has got the same title of fund, let alone the accumulation and the income Fashions. and the various different classes. Mm -hmm. So you just need to probably have a good look through the fund size, fees, all that sort of stuff. And it's the sort of stuff we've talked about before, I know, with, you know, read the fact sheet. Yeah. It's not exciting, but read the fact you sheet. You have to do some research, because otherwise you might be buying the bigger fund when actually, the same manager, you want the smaller fund. Yeah. Now, yeah. it might come with slightly higher fees, but it might be better than the other one. Or the other one is, maybe go and do a bit more research and invest, do some research and invest in the boutique fund managers, who basically are smaller just look at one area of the market and don't bother looking, I don't have funds in every market. Example, Terry Smith with Fundsmith and Lindsay Train with their funds, they are very concentrated. Terry Smith only looks at 
until very recently, just one fund. Yeah, Lindsay right. Train, they only have three funds. Global, Japan, and UK. That's it. They don't offer anything else. So sometimes, and this is where Fundsmith and Lindsay Train were very good when they first started, was they were small enough and very nimble, they can make the best of those other funds. So maybe there's lots of other companies and newer funds that come out, of which Blue Whale is one of the many, who do something similar to their global funds, but it's much, much smaller. It's in the hundreds of millions because it's only been around a couple of years. So again, there's some other fund managers like that, but they'll have names you won't have heard of because they haven't got the track record to be famous. Terry Smith, 10 years ago, didn't have a track record outside of the industry. Right, and, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's not, as you said, it's not necessarily Fundsmith's fault that it's got to that size. They are a victim of their own success. That Very much so. People will want some, like we said, who's... who's Who's getting double-digit growth? Well, typically it's Lindsay Train and Terry <laughs> Smith. So yeah, so it's not their fault necessarily, but I think if you are looking for unit trusts that could grow and turn into the likes of Fundsmith or Lindsay Train, they're quite difficult to find because, as you've just said, Philip, no, nobody's knows yet. <laughs> no, you've got you've got to go down to page ten in Google to find them, and then hope that they will be successful and that's you know that's crystal ball territory i guess so you mentioned their blue whale you said they were considerably smaller at the moment so they have a philosophy of being a global investing in global equities very similar to what terry smith and easy trains do with their global funds looking at companies that can grow their dividends and grow their business at the moment blue whale growth fund has a market size of 410 million and it's been going since September 2017. Now one of the few reasons why I came across this or in fact anyone really came across Blue Whale is because one of the investors into it was none other than Peter Hargreaves of Hargreaves Lansdowne, the co-founder of Hargreaves Lansdowne. I believe he put 25 million pounds in at the beginning because the fund manager used to work for him when he worked at uh, Hargreaves Lansdowne before he left to become a fund manager at a different group. So that's the reason why I'd heard of it, because one of their biggest shareholders or investors was somebody I'd heard of who was in the national papers. But otherwise, you probably not hear about them for another couple of years. But you're saying they're I mean, obviously considerably smaller than the other guys that we've mentioned around um, global equity. What do, does do the fees then go? Are they higher than the likes of Fundsmith? And Lindsay Train. So, looking at theirs, now Blue Whale has a couple of, because depending on which broker you go to, depends on what fee structure you'll pay, it's somewhere between 0.89 if it's Hargreaves Lansdowne, but it could be as high as 1.14% or 1.64%. So, they, yeah, those fees are tend to be ranging on the higher end than some of the others. Let's assume Blue Whale, as you said, are a bit... They're a bit more dynamic because they can buy smaller market capitalization companies, a bit like Fundsmith and Lensel Train were doing, I guess, when mm -hmm. they first started. You would offset the fees against growth. Yes. So it's a bet on that way. It's not proven. It's no guarantee. But that's generally, yes, what you'd have to look at. So I, I guess what we're saying there, Philip, size does matter because you can buy into large funds, pay not as low as the fees that you'd have for some tracker funds but these guys have got a, what would be classed as a good track record they've done well in the last 10 years will they do well in the next 10 years don't know but you'd probably think they're going to fare better than most or you you look for some smaller funds i guess it just comes down to again how you manage your risk for mm -hmm. your own portfolio and your own sanity because if you want some security don't invest in the stock market. <laughs> but if you want some security in large funds that have got a decent track record, you can do that. There are also some funds out there, as you said, that maybe haven't been going too many years, but the track record speaks for itself. You're not going to get stung too heavily for, for the fees. But you can, again, look at what you're comfortable to invest in and manage your own level of risk there. I think, you know, the the points you've made are fair around, you know, at the very beginning you talked about, you know, 17 companies being 45% of the market in the UK. You know, when you're buying the large funds, you know what you're going to get, essentially, which if you're happy with those big companies, that's great. If you want to look at something that's a little bit more exciting and might grow a bit more, you've got to go smaller, I think. I don't know, do you agree yeah. with that? Yeah, so 
there's been a lot of research that shows smaller companies tend to, over a longer period of time, grow better than big companies because naturally when you're big, it gets di very difficult to keep doubling in size when you're so big because eventually you run out of customers. You have to move to new markets. Mm -hmm. Whereas smaller companies, there's a lot more opportunities. But the only thing is, when you get to that, it's more about you need to do the research to some degree to find out what it is you're buying. And sometimes with some of the larger fund manager groups, you want to look do more research to find, actually I want to buy the smaller version of the bigger fund. No, that's a fair point. I, I think probably a, a slightly unfair question, but given the current, let's call it chop in the market, depends how much, how, how you like, uh, how choppy you like your market, but sometimes it's very choppy. Do you think these larger funds are a better bet over the next little while, and we really we're talking about a few years here, than some of the smaller company funds? It's quite difficult to say. In the short term, they'll probably be more stable because of the companies are investing in bigger, bigger cash flows, more stable cash flows. However, it's worth reminding, best investments come during crises because it gives the opportunity for smaller companies to go. The problem is it might be several years before the market realizes their potential growth prospects. So even if you invested in the smaller guys today, it might be several years before the market catches up and realizes. So yeah, I get, I get the sense there that, and it's the same with a lot of things around investing, is patience. Yes. Patience is key because if you make the decision to go in, let's say now on a particular fund, don't get too upset if things go down because as you say, you know, if those that, that fund's got potential around that area, it may well come back. It might not, it might be the wrong choice. But you've got to ride it out, I think. Yes. And what you need to ask yourself is, is what I ask myself is, what's the style of the fund manager? Why does he pick that company? what's his preferences and does that match your preferences yeah. and then when it comes down and going as Warren Buffett once said when the stock market all freezes up are you happy to own those companies for the next five years and not be able to sell them yeah really important point is are you happy to hold what you've bought and if you're not probably don't buy it in the first place yes. <laughs> would be a good bit of uh, a, a, a good point to finish on all right well I say thank you to Philip for joining us today and we'll see you next time This program has been presented for information and educational purposes only. None of the information or content of the program is to be taken as an offer, opinion or recommendation by the program's hosts or guests to buy or sell securities. Nor is it intended to provide legal, tax, accounting, commercial or financial advice. Opinions and comments are based on information from sources believed to be reliable. All investing involves risk as prices go up or down based on a number of factors. Always consider consulting a financial professional before investing.